In this video, we'll be going over lore characters who actually have significant lore in one way or another, and could really use more screen time in game. And at number 10, we have Tathalon Bloodwatcher. Everyone knows Bran Bronzebeard, the leader of the Explorers League and the brother of Mirrodin and Magni Bronzebeard, but does anyone know about Tathalon and the Reliquary? No. Tathalon spent most of his life training sorcery, until recently when he formed the Reliquary, at the behest of some rather shady people within the elven city of Silvermoon. Compared to most of her blood elves, he has an appreciation of magic and believes with proper teaching it is a force that can be utilized free of corruption. And with this ideal, his goal is to unify his race as they once were, and break their magical addiction. So to do so, he looks for magical items of great power to cure or weaken their dependency on magic. He also wishes to gather these to increase Silvermoon's power. So what is the Reliquary? Well, the rival of the Explorer's League. They are a group of Horde members set within Bloodwatcher Point that gather Titan artifacts within the Badlands and Uldaman, with both the Reliquary and Explorer's League at each other's throats. After the Cataclysm, he simply disappears though, not appearing into Legion where he appears in Azuna asking both Alliance and Horde members to recover Highborn artifacts for him, eventually leading him to find the Orb of Skeliax in Siramar, a lost relic given to the Elves during the War of the Ancients. For a force that's supposed to rival that of the Adventures League, it hasn't gotten anywhere near the same amount of attention. While the Explorers League gets constant quest lines, entire zone cameos, and even a couple of Hearthstone expansions, the Reliquary and their leader Tathalon Bloodwatcher are left to gather dust, like the artifacts they gather. Who would have thought that people would prefer a dwarf over a blood elf? And at number 9, we have Prince Ferrandis. Prince Ferrandis is the leader of the major reputation hub in Azuna during the Legion expansion. Although ever since Legion, he hasn't really shown up in the storyline at all. The story of Prince Ferrandis is told during a quest chain in Azuna, where you first meet some of the subjects of Prince Ferrandis who are ghostly night elves. And when you first encounter some of his subjects, pretty much all of them are very open about how much they just hate him. When you first meet Prince Ferrandis, one of his personal guards asked very hopefully if you're an assassin sent to kill the prince. So based on all of his men just hating his guts, it's very surprising to learn that Prince Ferrandis himself is actually very kind. He's constantly apologizing when his subjects spit on him when they see him, and he's more than willing to help you in your task of getting the Tide Stone. And when Prince Ferrandis accompanies you on a couple of quests, if you ever run into any creatures, Prince Ferrandis can immediately just kill them all rather easily with his meteors, showing that he's an incredibly powerful mage, and it just kind of builds all kinds of mystery towards what happened. How is this super powerful, kind, individual, ghostly creature just hated by all of his subjects? And eventually, you learn that he staged an unsuccessful coup in order to stop Queen Ajar during the War of the Ancients. In retaliation for daring to try and stand against her, Queen Ajar broke up the Tidestone and then cursed Prince Ferrandas and all of his people into their ghostly figures, where they're unable to die and constantly wander their land as ghosts. Eventually, during the quest chain, the adventurers get captured by the Naga and taken into a stronghold. And when Prince Ferrandis finds out this happens, launches a solo extraction to get you out of there. And you're able to play through his point of view on exactly what he did in order to rescue you. And basically what he did was just one man army a whole bunch of Nagas and Murlocs on the way. And even attacked Queen Ajar herself when she ran into him and tried to get him to join her side in exchange for lifting the curse. And since all of his people saw Prince Ferrandis stand up to Queen Ajar during this, they let go of a lot of their resentment, and join his side when they push for reclaiming the Tidestone. And then, after getting his people to no longer hate him as much, that's kind of it. Prince Ferrandis is only vaguely relevant to the story after his initial quest chain, despite being the reputation center for the entire zone, and the rep literally called the Court of Ferrandis. Ferrandis does have cameos here and there during different parts of Legion, but never with any speaking lines or doing anything significant. And then after the end of Legion, nothing. And during Battle for Azeroth, when there's a whole storyline involving Queen Ajara, Ferrandis is nowhere to be seen. Basically, there was never any closure for the Ferrandis storyline, and it was a pretty well set up storyline too. A prince hated by his people for failing 10,000 years ago, trying to seek redemption, and getting a glimpse of it before his storyline is just kind of abandoned. Although, since he did get a lot of in-game screen time when he was introduced, He's only at the number 9 spot on this list rather than at a higher spot. And at number 8, we have Shokia. Shokia is an orc sniper that we first meet in Mist of Pandaria, being part of the Hellscream's first platoon. She helps General Nazgrim in the hold of the Jade Forest, 
and alongside Shademaster Kirin, provides cover fire while exploring. She also acted as a guard for the prisoner Anduin, and then acts as a combat teacher to the Hosen who joined the Horde before being wounded during their fight at the Serpent's Heart. She appears a few times later as a background character, like helping the Darkspear Rebellion in the Siege of Orgrimmar, and overall, just a rather basic character. However, where she shines is come War Crimes. In the book War Crimes, she joins the True Horde, and working with them frees Garrosh from his trial. She helps Zalia gather allies and free others, but her major point comes during the attack on the Temple of the White Tiger, where she lands a fatal blow with her rifle on Jaina Proudmoore, leaving her to die, where she would have if not for the help of the Red Crane, Chi Ji saving her life. Sadly, she has basically disappeared from the story after that, leaving her open-ended with no other feats since, which for a character who landed what would have been a killing blow on THE Jaina Proudmoore, deserves far more screen time than what she's gotten and for sure deserves to be brought back into the story simply just to put her story to a final close. She was planned to show up in Warlords of Draenor and lose her right eye, but that was cut, among many, many other things in that expansion. And at number 7 we have Canrathod. Most people who've played Warlocks for a long time should be familiar with this character, as he's involved in the Warlock campaign in Legion and the Greenfire questline from Pandaria. Canrathod for Warlocks specifically is one of, if not the, most important character in its lore, possibly even more than Gul'dan. Want to know why? Well, first off, Canrathod is the reason why Warlocks could metamorphosis from Wrath of the Lich King into Legion, where funny enough, when he made a return, he still cast metamorphosis, an ability which is currently lost to Warlocks. Canrathod was present during the death of Illidan Stormrage, and then he brought the knowledge of demonic transformation to the Council of the Black Harvest, a group of Warlocks who contained all of the knowledge of the Warlocks, now including how to transform into a demon. Making it official come Cataclysm after the defeat of Ragnaros and Cho'Gal, they went to Outland to study demons and gather more knowledge and unknown warlock powers. They infiltrated the tower and learned many things, like the Shrine of Lost Souls within the tower was used to cleanse demons, allowing them to work under Illidan instead of feeling compelled to help the Legion. And that this well was intended to replace the Sun Well for the Blood Elves, but they were not to be given it until after the Legion's defeat. The Greenfire questline was quite unique, and it's a shame only Warlocks can experience this. And the fights themselves, which were big solo challenges, were later copied by the Mage Tower, and the whole questline itself was very well liked by the Warlock community. So to sum it up, lore-wise, Canrathod was the leader of all Warlocks, as the lead of the Council of the Black Harvest, and was the man behind many of the new spells Warlocks learned how to cast. Once you defeat him, his once apprentice Jubeka would banish him, intending to keep him banished forever. However, come Legion, a cult of the Green Flame attempted to unbanish him, but the little sanity he had left, he called for Jebeka to help him, as he did not want to endure a fate at the Legion's hand or join them. And so Jebeka and the Black Harvest free him, returning him to his human form where he thanks you, the Warlock player, and will remark about how he remembers you from the Black Temple and then joins your service. Canrathod is an insanely powerful warlock, and while Gul'dan is who everyone thinks of when they think of warlocks, Canrathod is the real warlock pushing himself to the limits of corruption in an attempt to gain power and might over demonic entities and energy, all for his allies, the Warlocks of Good, to defeat the Legion. He really does deserve more screen time, especially now that both of the Gul'dans are now dead for good. He could be the new face of the Warlock. And in number 6, we have Tirith and Court. Tirith and Court is a simple human hunter. He's not super powerful, or some high-ranking member of the Alliance, or some legendary hero. He's just a man, although a troubled one at that. So what makes him special to Warcraft lore? Well, he was recruited into the Alliance and was requested to lead a squad of scouts to the Serpent's Heart. However, he and his team were ambushed by the Shah, which killed all the hunters and their pets, Tirithin being the only one to survive the attack. He was not well though, and so he dragged himself through the forest surviving on whatever plants he could find, until he was found by Chen Stormstout and brought to the Shadowpan Monastery. There, he was tasked to tend to Vol'jin, who was also recovering there after he was betrayed by the Horde. Even though they were opposite factions, they became quite good friends, especially over their near mutual death. They then made a pact to kill whoever ends up killing the other one. Then they worked together in a whole bunch of stories that involved defending the Zouchen village from the Zandalari twice. Tirithin would then be seen again in Legion, at the funeral ceremony of Vol'jin. Of course, an Alliance human would never be allowed there, so you have to take quite a walk to find him hiding far in the distance between some rocks. Speaking to him, he would tell you how he vows to avenge his good friend. 
Please don't call the guards. I came to honor Vol'jin, not to cause trouble. He was a friend. We fought side by side against great odds. I owe that troll my life. We once swore to each other that, should one of us be killed, the other would avenge him. Always thought he'd outlive me. Whatever it takes, I'm going to make good on my promise. He can then be found in the True Shot Lodge, finally join the unseen path he'd been looking up to as hero since he was a kid. Although all he can think about is his lost friends, those lost to the Shaw attack and Vol'jin. For a character important to the story of Vol'jin, our only view of him is hanging out in the Hunter Class Hall, and in the distant background of Vol'jin's funeral. It's really not enough screen time for this character. And while the person who killed Vol'jin was just a random Felguard who likely died, it would have been amazing to see him join hunting down Sylvanas, partially responsible for his death at least. He's the only Alliance friend of Vol'jin, and their friendship is hidden from both factions, so he really deserves far more. And at number 5, we have Vandal. This was a character important enough to be a point of view character in the Illidan novel, although I'm sure this is the first time most of you are hearing about him. Vandal lived in Ashenvel, which was destroyed during the Third War by the Burning Legion, and saw his son get torn apart by a Felhound, which he then killed with a knife. When he stumbled out of his home after killing the demon, he ran into Illidan Stormrage, and believing Illidan to be behind the attack, tried to attack him, but was easily fended off by the demon hunter. Illidan was then so impressed by the killing of the Felhound with just a knife, he asked him to join him, but Vandal refused, with Illidan telling Vandal to seek him out later if he truly sought vengeance, even giving him the nickname Night Stalker. First off, one of the only people we can say that impressed Illidan in literally any way is amazing. But that's not even the start, as eventually Vandal did seek out Illidan, finding his way to Outland and scale on the Black Temple, where Illidan welcomed him with open arms, telling him he would find the vengeance he sought or die trying. In the Black Temple, Vandal made quite a few friends, all becoming demon hunters as well. Well, the surviving ones anyway. In his demon hunter transformation process, he devoured the heart of a Felhound, binding it to his soul, sadly forced to relive his memories of his own son's death but showing the infinite might of the Legion, and like most other demon hunters, he was so traumatized by this that he tore out his own eyes. And like other demon hunters, he began to hear the demon's voice that he consumed, or so he thought that's what he was hearing. As time went on, he would find out that the voice of the demon within was not a demon at least, but his growing insanity taking hold of his mind. He also later grew scales, which he did not like and tried to tear off, which nearly led to his death before being brought to a comma for healing. During training, another demon hunter lost control and entered their demon form, breaking their wards that blunted their weapons. He was about to enter a rampage, but no one seemingly noticed or cared, and unable to simply watch, Vandal murdered the demon hunter and consumed his soul to heal his wounds. Nearly half of all the elves that went to Illidan to take on the demon hunter process died during the whole ordeal, and most of them were due to self-inflicted wounds, due to the insanity brought on by consuming a demon and working with fell magic. Vandal turned out to be quite the powerful demon hunter, and so Illidan named him as one of their leaders, including him in Illidari council meetings, even calling him to help during the invasion of Nathreza, and importantly, multiple times against the High Lord Cruel, who if not for him would have crushed the forces of the Horde and Alliance shortly after entering Outland. Vandal was even there when the forces of a good assaulted the Black Temple. He was called to defend Illidan, but was unable to as he was forced into combat with Maiev nearly beating her in his demonic form, but after falling for a faint, he was cracked over his skull, left to die. However, he did survive, waking up later to be told by a voice of Illidan to prepare. Later, reunited with Illidan during the third Legion invasion, he was reunited with the Illidari on the Fellhammer in Mara Doom. So, what did this important character do during the Legion expansion? Well, he shows up once in the Demon Hunter Order Hall campaign, and that's about it. The right-hand man of Illidan, Someone Illidan trusted enough to lead missions for him, so much lore and so much potential for him to only be visible for a short time in Legion is kind of a letdown. And at number 4, we have Brawl Bear Mantle. Brawl is a very special night elven druid, born with antlers, which is an extremely rare gift of nature. Brawl was an amazing druid, but he still felt like a failure. He was at Mount Hyjal when the Legion and Scourge attacked the World Tree, and alongside his daughter they fought. However, they were cut off from their main forces of elves and ambushed by demons. He was able to call to the deep earth and defend himself, however, during the battle he would drop his idol of Remulus, given to him long ago by the immortal druid Remulus, which was destroyed by Asgalor, killing Brawl's daughter who was trying to protect him. As the grief of his daughter's death fell over him, feeling like it was his fault, many of the wild spirits abandoned him. The stag, 
panther, seal, and crow. However, one stayed, the bear, which he used to assist in dismantling the forces of the Legion. Feeling immense grief, he left the Night Elven Society, and allowed himself to be caught by Rhaegar Earthfury. He ended up in a gladiator group with Valyria and, soon after, a warrior named Logosh, after the Wolf Spirit. Of course, Logosh ended up being Varian Wren, stuck with magical amnesia. The three of them were a legendary team and quickly won the Crimson Ring Tournament, then working together to escape the servitude of battles to the death. The three of them then fled to the Silverwing Sentinels, which they then helped defend the Warsong Gulch from the Warsong Outriders, Brawl having become far too powerful for his own good, nearly causing a natural disaster before being knocked out by Logosh. They then set off to Ashenvale to gather his corrupted idol of Remulus, and to cleanse it of its fell energies, fighting off corrupted green dragons and corrupted furbolgs. Brawl was once again able to commune with more spirits than just the bear, which meant he was no longer only calling upon rage. Brawl then left the idol in Darnassus, he and his team then returned to Stormwind to bring Onyxia to justice, and return Varian to his rightful throne. Now, while Valyria and, of course, Varian had much more screen time, their third ally, Brawl, has had overall very little screen time in comparison. And there's even much more story we could go over from the Stormrage book about Brawl and how he helped save his friend Malfurion in Tyrande, being a main point of view character in that book, like Vandale in the Illidan book. But that's far too much to go over. We first see him in game in the Wrath of the Lich King prepatch, where he talks with the Varian about the threat of the Scourge although this was later retconned. But he was at least the quest giver for the Battle for Undercity, and even helped Varian fight one of the demon-filled settlements. After this, he would not be seen again until Legion, where he simply acted as a follower for the Druid player, and had a minor role in gathering the Idol of the Wilds from Valshara, only then seen again helping heal the wounds in Silithus and BFA. Brawl is a massive character in a few of the books, a main character in one of them, as well as the comics, and yet in-game, He's treated more like a random background character. Meanwhile, Valyria, the other member of the Gladiator Squad, is out in front of the story constantly, and is even the representation of the rogue class in Hearthstone. And at number three, we have Lirath Windrunner. Little is known of this man, and I'm sure many of you right now didn't even know he existed, but he is the youngest brother of the Windrunner siblings. Yeah, it's not the Windrunner sisters, it's the Windrunner siblings. Outside of Illyria, Varisa, and Sylvanas, there was also a brother. He dreamed of becoming a ranger like his sisters. However, when the orcs attacked Azeroth and charged Quathalas, he was killed alongside their uncles, aunts, and cousins. Illyria swears revenge to hunt down every single orc. And that's pretty much it. For someone as important as a brother of the Windrunners, there's not much more about him. We do get to see him in the Three Sisters comic, a whole ten years after being introduced in the book Beyond the Dark Portal. Although, funnily enough, in The War of the Ancients, they mentioned two brothers, but that was retconned in War Crimes, where they say they only had one brother. Lirath and Illyria were nicknamed the Sons of the Family because of their bright gold hair. And with Sylvanas in the limelight right now, dealing with the afterlife and undeath, it really would be a shame if we do not hear her talk about him. Maybe even attempt to bring her long-lost brother back to life. And at number two, we have Dementius. Dementius the All-Devouring is a powerful Void Lord, but not a Void Lord. There is a difference. Void Lords are basic Void Beings, like those controlled by Warlocks. Void Lords are the most powerful of the Void creatures in League, even above the Titans. So, yes, they use the same name, but one is a super big deal, and the other is like a Warlock pet. Dementius was a very big and powerful Warlock pet variant, though. Dementius somehow found his way to Karesh, the homeworld of the Ethereals. There, he then opened countless gateways to the Void and Twisty Nether which bathed the planet in insane amounts of arcane and shadow energies. One of the planet's races built magical barriers to block the dark energies, but the arcane energy was not blocked and tore away their flesh, leaving nothing but their souls. However, not killing them, instead infusing their souls with the massive amounts of arcane energy left behind. They then became ethereals, floating spirits of arcane energy, able to wrap themselves in bandages and clothing or armor to return to their mortal forms and interact with things. However, this curse was also a blessing, giving them massively enhanced minds and magical abilities. They then used this newfound power to fight him off. But unable to finish the job, they were forced to flee into the Twisted Nether, chased by Dementius' forces. Dementius also attacked a world named Krakora. However, the Naru Ture arrived to defend it, exploding its own life force shattering into fragments, banishing Dementius from the world. 
But come the Burning Crusade, we finally find him within the Mana Forge in the Netherstorm. And with the help of the Protectorate Ethereals, we kill him. And quite easily too, oddly enough. The story of the Ethereals' origins and their planet as well as its destruction is quite amazing. And with a heavily hinted at light versus void expansion in the future, giving Dementius his worthwhile screen time, and exploring the destroyed worlds he consumed would be an amazing stick for a character butchered so badly. And at number one, we have Murmur. In game, most people simply know it as the final boss of the Shadow Labyrinth dungeon. However, Murmur is much more than that. He is described as many things, cosmic being, extra planar being, war beast, and the essence of sound. However, what he actually is, is an otherworldly elemental from a distant corner of the universe, born long ago in a dimension of the cosmos unfathomable to mortal minds, and so powerful that its entrance into existence shattered all reality around it. Mindless, only existing for chaos, its barest whispers was enough to destroy worlds. Mortals tried to worship it, and some even tried to control it, but it simply yawns and could destroy all of them. However, one mortal managed to survive and devised a ritual that allowed him and his allies to bring Murmur into their world, using many captured souls. Whole civilizations were brought to extinction through this device, allowing them to summon the creature, which they used powerful magic to contain, fueled by constant souls. However, unable to bend it to their will, they tried many rituals, none to succeed, and accidentally giving him even the slightest amount of freedom, the world was instantly destroyed. A codex speaking of this is the only thing that somehow made it out. Terran Gore and his warlocks, trying to fight the Draenei and Achendum, reach beyond the Veil of Reality, trying to summon a powerful demon. Instead, accidentally summoning Murmur, who upon appearing in Achendum, instantly blasted the entire tomb, tearing it apart, ending life within it instantly, and even leveling the surrounding forest, now named the Boned Waste. The Shadow Council was then able to contain it, being much more careful than the other countless worlds had. Although, once we actually get to fight it, it is surprisingly a pushover, killed by a couple random adventurers. WoW lore is very wacky sometimes, especially in the Burning Crusade, which had retcons to the moon and back. With the acknowledgement that elementals don't actually die unless killed in their plane, the possibility for a space expansion, where the full-fledged form of Murmur being a major villain would be absolutely amazing. A sound elemental who has no motives, no plans, no ideals, anything, simply a massive beast of insane power that must be destroyed. None of the, are they really good, they're evil bad guy monologue makes me think maybe they are a good guy. No, this big elemental literally just destroys entire worlds by coughing. It needs to be destroyed. But between Dementius and Murmur, TBC really loved to introduce enemies who destroyed entire planets like they were nothing. And yet, five random adventures kill it without problem. TBC lore was really peak wow. Alright, and that's the video. If you like the topic, you have Raven from the Patreon to thank for picking the topic with his reward.